Hi everyone, uh, my name is John Osborne here with ChainGuard. I'm going to give you a quick crash course on the Six Door Policy Controller. So let me share my screen here and I'll tell you a little bit about why I'm here and uh, why this talk. So uh, my job at ChainGuard is to um, essentially take customers from the journey of, I want to um, you know, start my software supply chain journey, um, but now what, right? And, you know, I noticed there was a gap missing um, in terms of uh, educational content where, you know, customers would start using SIGSTOR to um, start signing their artifacts, start signing um, their code, start signing SBOMs, start signing various attestations or security scans, et cetera. Um, but, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of examples out there around, you know, what to do next with all that information. Um, there's plenty of examples in the SIGSTOR docs around how to uh, and a lot of uh, other places too around how to verify um, that a signature exists or that an attestation exists or that an SBOM exists. But if you actually want to go towards that next step of creating policies around your custom tooling, around um, the content of some of these attachments and attestations, um, there's not a ton of things out there. So the goal of this talk is to give you a little bit of insights into the Six Store Policy Controller, how it works. And then we're gonna do a little bit of a custom attestation um, by example, where we sign a code review and then validate it one step at a time and, and kind of build that out. And I put all the code examples um, on, a, on a GitHub repo, which is also, uh, I'll share towards the end of the deck as well. All right, I'm not gonna cover, this is more of a uh, 201 level talk, but I'm gonna, um, if, you're, if you're not too familiar with, with SigStore, I'm going to give just a quick primer before I get into the policy controller aspect, um, which is uh, the, really the focus of this presentation. So SigStore itself, you know, really, if we look at a lot of the software supply chain um, threats that are out there, where Sign uh, SigStore comes in really is that um, it's very easy to use signing service. So you can sign and verify all the handoffs um, and verify a lot of the dependencies that you're pulling into your organization. And the idea is that I can I can close off a threat vector by signing something and then verifying on the on the receiving end that something hasn't been tampered with because I'm going to check the signature sign of the artifact hasn't been tampered with. I can check um, who signed it. Um, I can check some of the uh, attached uh, evidence to it, which would be like an attestation, for instance, a security scan. Um, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that was very quick, um, but if you if you look at a lot of the supply chain frameworks that are out there, um, Salsa, NIST, um, CIS, um, there's a bunch of others that have just started to add um, software supply chaining, uh, software supply chain um, uh, guidance. A lot of it really is around signing and, verif and verifying a lot of the different artifacts and handoffs in the environment. So at, at a high level, that's where uh, SigStore can come and help because it's very easy to use and it can be automated very, very easily um, for people and machines uh, to use. So the whole really, the whole purpose around SigStore is that it's easy so that developers don't have to, really have to manage keys anymore. So in this case, um, this is just a screenshot where I'm signing a, a random YAML file. And the way it works, this is in key list mode. There's plenty of ways to sign with, with SigStore, um, not just key list mode. You can automate with a KMS backend. You can automate with your um, existing keys, a number of ways to do it. Um, but with key list mode, what happens is um, similar to using any third-party app. It logs a little pop-up, and you can log in with another user, um, or we're logging with another identity provider as your user. So in this case, you can log in with Google or GitHub. And then what's going to happen on the back end is SigStore is going to take that OIDT, OIDC token that you generated, and it's going to generate you an X509 certificate with the identity that was um, vetted from the OIDC token. And that certificate's going to be very short-lived, in a lot of cases, uh, 10 minutes. And um, then you can sign your artifact, and the signature will go um, in an OCI registry. If it's a container image, it'll go in the git commit if you're signing a git commit, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I mentioned something called git sign. That's really an extension of SigStore to sign git commits. You can, um, it's under the SigStore git sign repo. You can, it's very easy. You can 
essentially just enable it per repo or per um, for all your repos. And that's just a one-time thing. And then every time you do a git commit, it'll automatically uh, pull up that pop-up box and you can log in and sign your, um, sign your artifacts, sign your git commits that way. Um, and as I mentioned, it's stored in the signature itself will actually be stored in the, in the git commit. And that's just to look at it uh, here on the right. I took a screenshot showing the git log, which will actually print out some of the, um, some of the information uh, related to the signature there. Now, we want um, SigStore in, in, to be very easy to use so we can sign and verify all these things. So I just put together a quick primer on what the commands would look like. Um, but ultimately what you're doing here is really generating this kind of supply chain uh, metadata. So you can, if you sign something, you'll have a signature. If you, you might sign certain evidence like an SBOM, for example, because um, of course, you know, an S bomb is no good if it's if it can be tampered with, right? So you're gonna you might sign an S bomb, you might sign um, an attestation around provenance, which is really how your code was built. So a lot of tools will spit out, you know, a lot of information like the git commit that was used, or you know, some of the parameters and flags that were passed as part of the build. You know, you want to have that that body of evidence as you're, um, you know, creating all these handoffs from development to production. And it could be something as simple as, you know, I ran a trivi scan against my container image or a sneak scan, and I want to sign the output, right? Because later I want to verify that, you know, there were no critical CDEs at the time of the time of scanning, or just that I, to know that I just did the output, or I just did the signing, and I can sign off on that also. Uh, some big news, um, within the last uh, couple weeks, SigStore went uh, GA. So Cosign was, this was a little confusing for some people, but Cosign was already GA, but uh, Recore and Falsio, the backend, um, supporting services um, specifically around keyless signing. Those are GA now, so that's huge. Um, keyless signing is, is great uh, just because you can work it in with a lot of existing workflows, um, especially for um, people adopting Salsa in these frameworks where you want your build service to sign uh, the artifacts so you can have cryptographic evidence that something came from the build service and it hasn't been tampered with. Um, now, the services themselves going GA, that's huge, um, but you know, one of the things that people uh, might miss with the announcement, which is probably just as big, is the SLOs and on-call rotation that's happening now. So that really started with the GitHub announcement and partnership to back in August. Um, but there's a lot of big companies helping support SigStore now. Chingard's just one of many. Um, and so it's a, it's a great project. And, um, you know, I think you can confidently sign with uh, and use SigStore, um, especially if you look at all the, the rapid adoption and, uh, and, uh, and high availability of it. Uh, another thing too is, you know, now that Six Store has gotten uh, really just, you know, generated that um, generated that momentum behind it. I wrote a little script that pulls a lot of the artifacts off Artifact Hub, and they actually have a Six Store uh, flag in their API now. So um, the last time I checked a week or two ago, uh, it was over 50% of the artifacts, or at least the container images, have already been signed by Six Store. And there's lots of programming languages too that are now adding signing. So if I go to use Python, for instance, I can validate the digital signature of Python using using SigStore, and that's huge because now I know that that Python hasn't been tampered with. And if you if you think about a lot of the way enterprises kind of bring in these releases, you know, it's checksum at best, but even that's kind of a one-time thing. And the way things get handed off internally or moved between enclaves or environments, a lot of times, you know, we're not actually rebetting the the um, our artifacts to make sure they haven't been tampered with. And the fact that six store is getting used um, uh, at, or at such a high rate, you know, that's a lot of artifacts that we can validate that haven't been tampered with. So, okay, so on to the policy controller. So the, the six store policy controller itself is really a Kubernetes um, uh, admission webhook. It's a, it's a validating webhook and it gives you that go or no go aspect to it. Now, there's a lot of examples, as I mentioned at the beginning, at the beginning of the talk, around um, you know signing things with cosign, you running cosign, you know verify verify to verify the signature. You can create an attestation with cosign a test, and then you can verify the um, attestation with cosign also using the ver cosign ver verify attestation command. Um, but ultimately, if you want to get more complex outside of just saying that those things exist. Um, you start wanting to write your own policies that might, might match, you know, whatever things you have going on with your security posture or compliance or regulatory frameworks, et cetera. Um, 
you might have to uh, create a custom policy. And that's really what the, the heart of this talk is about. So before I get into customization, just want to throw on a few examples of what this might look like. Now, these were actually public examples um, where people put in the logs. So I, I like to use real examples. Um, this one was is part of Salsa, and uh, it's really where I think a lot of people are trying to get to. So um, what this is, is um, this would be for Salsa level three, and it's um, an authenticated and non-falsifiable build service. So what that means is that you know, there's a everyone, you know, CICD is not necessarily a novel idea at this point. You know, a lot of people have built out CI CD pipelines and things like that. Um, but you know, especially in a large organization, there's a lot of ways to get into the front door. And a lot of times there's not necessarily um, a check or block that things actually went through the pipeline. So what this would do is you you sign um, the build service will actually sign itself, not not a person, it would actually come from the build service. And then on the receiving end, you could have a policy, a six door policy that says, I'm using the policy controller that says, um, something um, I've authenticated that there's cryptographic evidence that this came from the build service and hasn't been tampered with. So that would be one example. Uh, another example might be a code review. This is um, part of Salsa, but also part of a lot of other frameworks. Uh, PCI now released code reviews as part of their um, supply chain guidance for um, uh, for uh, that they just released this year. And this isn't a standardized format yet. Um, but this is just one example of it. It might be an attestation, which could just be a you know YAML or JSON document, and then you could validate um, using signatures. So you know in this case, Dan and Kim both signed, and then you could verify that they both signed this attestation, which would have some metadata in it, for instance. And you could use different tools, like if you use uh, GitLab or GitHub, um, especially with the enterprise versions, you can do code reviews, and then you could have these attestations generated as part of that and attach them to artifacts. So later you have cryptographic evidence that a code review was done um, for certain things. And then you could create policies around this also. Last example, um, SBOMs, because they really are a hot topic, especially with uh, CVEs that are that are out there now. So you know, I can sign my SBOM, which is great because SBOMs aren't helpful if they can be tampered with. So signing the SBOM would would give you that um, that integrity aspect to it. But you might want to create a policy that says the SBOM exists, but then also actually start validating the content of the SBOM. So in this case, um, this is an example uh, of log for shell. So we're just parsing the SBOM to see if particular versions that might be affected um, of the log for J API or log for J core would be part of the SBOM. And I can create uh, policies based around that. And those could be policies that just warn you and flag you, or they could be policies that actually block um, on how to do that. So that's all hypotheticals. and Not expecting you to learn this yet. I'm going to walk through it a little, at a uh, slower pace once we actually get to building out the policies. So everything in SigStore for policy follows this CRD called cluster image policy. And there's really three parts to it. Um, the first two are mandatory. The third one is not mandatory. Um, the, the first two are, the first one's very simple. It's just what images am I going to apply this policy to, right? And so that's a, a URI to point to a registry. I can put in um, wildcards in there if I want to. The second piece is the authority. So that's actually what, what or who signed them. So in this case, uh, I'm going to uh, have a policy that says that it had to be signed using SigStore. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, using the keyless signatures in here. This could be some sort of pointer and automation to longer lived keys or um, KMS using, you know, GCP or AWS or whatever it may be. There's a whole bunch of options in here. Um, the other piece to it is who signed it, and that's really important. And I think I'll just pause there for a second because I think that's a pretty big fundamental difference between typical you know signing that you may be used to and you know moving into more of a supply chain framework um, component to it so and what I mean by that is historically the way things have normally been signed you really care more about the key because you're managing the key so you care more about the private key and then you know um, validating that with a public key when you go into adopt a supply chain framework you're not necessarily managing the keys all the time. And because things can be automated, 
you do have a more a granular identity associated with the key. So, you know, if we're being honest in a lot of, you know, enterprise um, signing scenarios, you know, up until now, probably even including to, and now, right? A lot of times keys get in, issued and they're not very um, granular. It might be the, the, it might be, you know, have a wide and net as the entire build service uses, um, the entire pipeline uses the same key, right? And a lot of times, um, especially more regulated organizations, they probably don't even trust their developers with a key. So you're not really validating that developers signed it. You might be um, validating that they pushed somewhere and did something else, right? Um, but with Six Store, you can get a lot more granular than that. So this is a policy that we use internally at ChainGuard, where we make sure that um, if you wanna sign a, if you wanna um, push a git commit to any of our products, this is something that we use. This is actually the policy that we use, is you have to authenticate and sign, um, you have to authenticate with Google and with a chainguard.dev email address, which essentially means we use Google as our um, authentication provider. So essentially what our identity provider, so essentially what that means is you have to have a chainguard.dev email address and um, and sign in with it uh, in order to generate a valid uh, signature. Now, the third part is the optional component to it. Those are attestations. So I like to think of that as attachments or evidence um, and again, that's not necessarily uh, a mandatory field, but if you wanted to, for instance, you know, sign an uh, SPDX document, and then you could create attestations around that. So that would be, okay, I want to search for a specific CVE as an example. Um, that would be an attestation that you could sign um, and create a policy around. Now, the way these work um, is with a six store con policy controller, if you want to deploy an image to Kubernetes, it essentially works like this. If you, um, if a single uh, a single policy will pass if any authority has signed to these things. Now you can put in a whole, and what, why, I'm, why I say that is because you can put in a whole array of keys that would be valid and attestations that would be valid. If any of the valid keys have signed any of the valid attestations that you include, well then the, it will pass. Um, if there's, if you have multiple different policies, um, well, then they all need to pass. So if you had, you know, for instance, a policy that says um, everything has to be signed by ChainGuard, but then you had another policy that said um, don't admit anything with the log for shell vulnerability, then it would it would block. Um, and I put a couple references down here if you wanted to go see what all the fields could be, um, but those are really at a high level. It's these three components. What am I? What are the images? What are the signatures? And what are the attachments really? Now, the way you turn this on, and this is uh, somewhat new also. So uh, in Kubernetes, the way it'll enforce is by uh, by namespace labels. And that's the way it's been done since early on in SigStor. So I can just create a label for my namespace uh, using policy sigstore.dev um, slash include, set that to true, and it'll start going to enforcing mode. If I wanted to do a break glass scenario, for instance, you know, I'm coming in on the weekends and I don't want anything to block anymore, whatever that may be, I can just remove that label. Assuming I'm, I have that permission set up, you know, I'm a cluster administrator and, and I can do that. Now, one thing that just got pushed within the last few weeks, so this might be new, even if you're, you know, not new to Six Store, uh, you might not have seen this unless you're following you know, GitHub all the time, is there is a more granular label selector now. So I can set things uh, on a per namespace instance, but I can also you know, have policies that apply to stateful sets or um, deployments, and, and I can get a lot more granular with that also. Now there's a, there's a lot of images, a lot of um, examples of how to uh, create policies for images that are upstream. Some of them are in, uh, spread across a couple of repos in the six store repository. We've also been um, creating a lot of these internally for customers. Our goal is to push all of these upstream. So uh, look for that in the near future also. So if we create new policies for specific CVEs or other things that are that are out, our goal is to start just pushing these all into the six store repo. Uh, we don't really want there to be <clears throat> um, secret sauce around that. It should be, um, the policy should be available for anybody to use. So, uh, also, this is um, somewhat new also, is you can add, um, for the cluster image policy, you can actually add different modes. So on a per policy basis, and this will be new for a lot of people, but you can actually create um, uh, policies around what you want to do 
when something does match. So if you label the namespace, I think by default, what's going to happen is if the namespace is labeled and the policy fails, well, then you'll be denied. Um, but you can set that to warn mode, which is really helpful too if you want you know, certain policies to be admitted, but to flag a system somewhere, um, but you don't necessarily want to block or slow down based around the security posture, right? Um, so that that's something that you can set on a um, per cluster basis or on a per policy basis. Now, um, building the cluster image policy, you'll see that there's some examples that are out there, but they're pretty uh, rudimentary, I'd say. Um, you know, you can look at these first two examples. There's a million examples that'll show you just how to set up the images and authority section. Um, you can also create a catch-all if you want to. Uh, for you know, static pass fail for certain things, um, all that's built in there. Um, but really, the attestations is where I want to focus most of this talk. And there's built-in schemas for things like SPDX, for things like Cyclone DX. Um, there's uh, built-in support for Intoto, which is an attestation format. Um, but you also might just want to sign. You know, the attestations could be anything, right? So they could be just random JSON that you have in-house tools, and you want to build policies around those outputs whatever it may be, um, but you might notice this. And if you are if you look down the bottom, um, the types can be in Rego or Q. And um, you know, Q is incredibly powerful language. Um, and so I'm gonna give you a quick primer on how to validate some of this, um, some of these policies using Q for the rest of this talk. So at a high level, now I think one of the things, the gaps, that it exists probably if, if we're being fair in Q is that it's incredibly powerful, but a lot of the things that you can do with it are, if you go look at the docs are all, um, you know, kind of lumped together, I guess you could say. And so if you, but if you only care about creating six store policies, you really only care about using Q for data val validation. Now it's, it's really powerful. If you look at a lot of the examples that are out there with Q, uh, Q can be used to generate, um, artifacts like Terraform modules or Ansible modules, which I've seen, we're actually used looking at it internally to generate some of our artifacts as well. Um, but for the pol for the point of six store policies, you really only care about doing data val validation. So uh, a few things that you need to know the most about it for data validation is that first is it's a superset um, of JSON. And that's great because then you can, if you have an existing JSON um, or JSON schema, even better, it becomes incredibly easy. So if you have a tool that has a JSON schema, there's actually a Q import command that actually gives convert that entirely to Q if you want, and then validate it in the doc. If you have random JSON that you want to match against, the policy, the Q policy for data val validation can actually just be raw JSON if you want to. That's perfectly valid to do that also. So it makes it very easy to adopt because you know, virtually any tool will output JSON or something that can be converted to JSON. Um, the second is that it treats types and values the same, and you'll see that as as I do the the validation. So I can set something to be a string, or I can set it, to, and then I could set it something uh, more uh, specific. Like for instance, you know, the string might be my email address, right? And then I can create policies um, that just can get more granular as we go. Um, another piece is that it, the order is irrelevant, and so that's actually really helpful from a um, from a validation perspective because, well, one, it just makes it less brittle, uh, but two, if you get something really complicated and there's a lot of inferred values, well, you can use this command, which I'll, uh, which I'll demo for you, or, or I got a screen, screenshot at least, um, called trim, Q trim. There's a command line tool for Q and it'll remove all those things and condense things very nicely. And so it's a lot more easily uh, readable. Uh, and then, you know, Q is just very flexible, so you can create if you want things to be open, for instance, which, you know, if you're using JSON, you probably do because there might be more fields later, or you can be uh, very specific and have things closed. That, that's really all up to you. So I wanted to walk through a specific example um, and, how it, uh, and how it builds out, um, but I'm going to give you a little bit more uh, material just so you can validate what some of this stuff is. So um, Q is a JSON superset. That's great. Opens up big, big ecosystem. Um, I'm, I don't program in Go every day, right? So I, there's a lot of Go extensions where it can take a lot of, uh, you know, open, open API schemas and um, you know different things that might be have first class support in Go, and create you know Q 
data, you know, schemas and things, right? That's great. But I'm not a Go programmer and I don't want to write a bunch of code just to validate a policy, right? So, so Q has this great command line tool that you can download on their page. And it's really helpful for validating policies because um, if I have something with an existing JSON schema, that's great because I can just write Q import and I'll output the Q. Um, if I have Q code, I can just do Q output and uh, it'll output JSON for me. And then if I want to do some validation without using my images or anything at all, just to, you know, shift left and get, um, get you know, that feedback loop to be really kind of lightweight, I can just use QEVAL and evaluate uh, JSON locally on my machine also. So um, that's uh, really helpful from that perspective. Uh, I mentioned that it ignores the orders of the rules. So this is a policy. You don't know, so have to know or care too much about what the, the syntax of it. But what this policy is doing here on the right is it's um, it's checking against a serif. So serif is an OASIS standard for SAS tools uh, around standardizing some of their output. And some some uh, security scanning tools, like in, in this case, I uh, use Trivi. Uh, Trivi can output into serif, which is great because if you have a bespoke tool, you can write your own policy for it, and that's easy to do. But if you have something that outputs in a standardized format like Serif, well, then you can use the same policy to validate against multiple different outputs. And so, in this case, um, I've got a trivi I had a Trivi scan, um, although the output standardized, and it's just going to look for CVEs with a score higher than 9.0, which would be a critical CVEs. And just since the the order is ignored, it's really helpful because it can reduce a lot of the boilerplate code. You don't really want anything to be um, any uglier than it than it already is, right? Um, especially when we're looking at JSON outputs and things. We want things to just be concise and human readable. Uh, and then because of that, you can also run QTrim. So in this case, I ran QTrim on that last one, and it made things uh, you know, a lot easier to read here. Uh, if I had a lot of inferred values here, well, it could have even cropped those out. So it could even crop those down more. Um, but in this case, I, I pretty much always run QTrim just to have the most concise uh, policy that I that I need. I don't really want any more text uh, than I need in there. Great. So let's build this out in action. I'm going to go slow for this part, but I'm not expecting, you know, I wouldn't expect anybody to learn Q just from this presentation. But my goal is to help you learn I, uh, what you can do with Q, kind of what it looks like, and then give you some examples and really just get you started. Um, if you have specific examples, you know, feel free to just tag me in the SIGSTORE uh, Slack. Um, I'll reply in there. I'm happy to you know, help anyone that gets stuck. We're also working with a Q team to get more examples that are out there. Um, but we want, I think a good goal, what I'd like to get to is to the point where if you want to do anything that's not um, you know, completely off the, off the grid, then there should be an example for you at least to start with and um, and generate uh, artifacts based around that. You should be able to fork something essentially and make minimal changes to it unless you want to get really deep into the uh, into the doing something really custom. So in this case, um, I've got a code review format, which uh, this is just a sample format that I've created, and um, essentially we're going to validate three things. Uh, incrementally, and I'll talk about how to do that and what this policy would look like. So the first thing I'm going to do is val validate this repository format here. Then I'm going to validate that my email for the author came from example.com because I don't want any, uh, I, I don't want code coming into my production environment unless it was written by my company, which is example.com in this one, in this sense. Um, and then I want it to be too peer reviewed. So uh, in this case, all I'm going to check is that uh, the reviewer was not the same person as the author. So you want to make sure that the review is independent. So before I get into actually checking the repo, I wanted to point this out because this is um, this is very important. If you plan to create any custom policies, make sure you pay attention to this slide. So in my example, and if I click on this log here, um, it'll take me to the public record instance where you can see where I signed this code review. And this link will work in the in the deck. It's also in the README, which I put uh, on the GitHub repo with all these examples in it too. Um, but you'll notice when I signed this, I used, if I go back a sec here, I ran cosign a test. 
So cosine, the command line tool, I attested to this and I gave it, it the specific command I gave will be on the um, will be on the readme. Um, but and then I passed it this uh, this JSON file here as the predicate. So what it did was it put took that JSON and put it inside a um, in Toto attestation. And when I want to validate this, there's really just two fields. There's this data field and there's this timestamp field. Now, this might look a little new to you if you've used cosine a test before, because if you run cosine on the command line uh, and you're testing known formats, it's not going to be all packed in here. But for the purposes of custom attestations and using the SIG store controller, everything just kind of gets put in this big string. But don't worry, it's still it's not a big deal at all. Um, there's built-in tools to help fix that. So really, you have two options. Now, um, you can just parse that string out using Q. So you can create a policy that just parses the string out on the left. Uh, in this case, I'm just using a regex. So you know, wouldn't expect anyone to uh, necessarily know regex. I know I always have to Google regex format pretty much off the top, off, uh, off, <laughs> offline. Um, but on the left, what I'm doing is I'm just setting a simple policy to parse the string there. Now. That'll, this policy in the left will fail if the phrase bad, 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 you know, two bads are okay, but th three bads is just over the line. So um, it'll fail this policy if it's got bad, bad, bad. Now, this is usually good enough for a lot of things, especially for people just starting off because they might just want to validate that, um, that something exists in the attestation or doesn't exist in the attestation. And a lot of times a really common way to do this might be you might be checking for a specific version of software or something in your SBOM. If you just care that the um, pattern for that, that specific file or thing you were looking at was in the SBOM, all you have to do is here on the left is just write a regex that checks against that. So it's very, very simple. But if you want to check um, that things are nested inside element inside other elements, you really want to do something very powerful um, with Q. Q can do a lot more things than JSON can do. There's logic to it. There's you can even create um, conditional things in here that would you know potentially do for loops and things like that. Um, but there's built-in tools to do that. So if you remember it was just one big long ugly string, I can create um, another element in here that uh, and use a built-in uh, JSON encoder that comes as part of Q and create a JSON, what they call a struct. And then once I create a struct, well, then I can just start um, use that built-in Q package to create the JSON, and then I can start validating it just like I would using any other um, Q aspect for JSON. And again, Q is a JSON superset, so I could even put raw JSON in here if I wanted to. So the first thing I'm going to do is validate the repository. So in this case, I want to validate three things. I want to validate that the branch is set to either main or origin slash main. That is just in queue is pretty simple. It's just that or bar. We should all be familiar with that. The second thing I'm going to do is I want to know that the URI is came from my company. So I want or, or my organization in GitHub. So in this case, it's going to be um, the URI has to be github.com slash example, because that's my organizational uh, GitHub, uh, my GitHub organization. And then the third thing is that type, which you can see in the example is set to git. I'm going to let that just be any old string. That's perfectly fine. Um, anything can be put in there um, because I don't necessarily know what that type might. I don't know all the options that type might be. So I just put that little question mark in there, and that'll allow for that. And then since this is a, I'm creating a, essentially a schema here by adding the um, what they call a definition in queue with this hashtag. And if I don't add these dot, dot, dots, it'll be a, what's called a closed struct, which means that um, everything has to match exactly, but I won't be able to add more fields later. So typically what I like to do is add the dots just because, which makes the definition open. So that way, if you're, if you're using JSON, there's a good chance that you might be adding more things to a schema later. So I like to uh, uh, have that flexibility. So in this case, I'm going to check that predicate data. So I'll just, just like in the last example, I've got JSON data here. I'll marshal it. And then I'll just make sure that there's a repo field embedded in that JSON that matches the schema. So I will uh, run that for you against 
of this example. Oh, I'm only sharing my screen here. I'm gonna sh I'll share the rest of my screen to do that. Sorry, you have to look at me for a second. All right, so I'm just gonna write cosine verify. I'm going to add the repo check, which was the um, which was the queue statement that I just showed you in the presentation, and then I'll give it the slash type for custom. And when we run this, it should verify, and you'll see this will be validating against the queue signatures repo dash check dash q and then there's a bunch of garbly goop down here if i wanted to print this out to see what it looks like i can just use jq to do that and i think it would look like this it looks like but let's see Okay, and and I'll set that to unfortunately it was encoded twice, so let me see if I I think I kept the command inside my readme here, so we'll check that. Here we go. All right. Went off the grid somewhere. So there we go. So that was the existing um, JSON, which you saw in the code review. And this part of the validation for the repo check is just checking, making sure that the repo follows that format. It's got the JSON needs a repo struct, and it needs to have a type field that's set to anything. It needs to have the URI set to github.com slash example, and it's got to have a branch that is set to main or origin slash main. All right, next example. All right. So second one is a lot simpler. If I come up here, uh, all we're saying now is this the author. The author has to be a string, and they have to have an email address that came from example.com because I want them to you know, be someone that works for my company, of course. Um, so I can create uh, that definition for that schema. And then all I'm going to do down here is just make sure that this JSON has an author field, and that author field equals the author uh, uh, structure from, um, from my definition here. So not too difficult. Um, just make sure the author is a string, and it's got uh, a string that ends with a, at example.com. And you can see that's regex here, more regex. So come back to my example here. And all I'm going to check changes the policy file, which is the queue. This is just for checking locally. Um, I'll show you how to move this into the uh, into the repo or into the six star policy controller when we get towards the end. And you can see, yep, it validated against that key policy author dash email. Next, let's see. Finally, a uh, third thing I'm going to do is check that the it's an independent review. So I'm going to check take the author field, which we already know is a string from the previous example. And then I'm just going to make sure that there's a reviewer field that's also a string and that they don't equal each other. And this is a differentiator between JSON and Q. You wouldn't be able to really compare fields just doing raw JSON, right? Um, you'd just be able to know that they had certain you know, traits about them. Um, but with Q, I can make sure that uh, I can actually compare these values, which makes it really powerful. So I have a reviewer, and it's going to not equal the author there. And then when I put this, embed this down inside my uh, JSON data, 
all it's going to make sure it's a top level item. So it's just going to make sure that the, all the JSON data that's there follows um, follows that format. And so, so you can see what I'm working with. That's the uh, example from the slide. And I can run cosine verify. Again, you don't have to necessarily write down all these commands. All, they're all going to be um, on the read on the README with all the full examples. Oh, was it author? I think it's independent author. Independent review dash view. And it didn't like that. It said, well, I got an error. Um, it said field not allowed repo. OK, this is actually a good, um, you know, this breaking is not, is, not a, is not a bad thing to be showing here. So why did this break? Well, if I come back to the policy here, go back to my slide. Come back to the policy. What it's saying is independent review. OK, well, if you remember, I said if I didn't add these dots down here, the struct is closed. So that means the repo information would now be invalid. Essentially, it would say um, expect an attestation that only had author and only had reviewer. So I can make this struct open to fix this. So what I'll do is I'll come back to my independent review and I'm going to add these dots here. And that'll allow my repo data. And I will run this again. And that should work. Perfect. So that worked. And before I forget, I'm going to come back to my example here at the end and make sure that these other ones also uh, are val validating against these things. OK. So I will update that slide screenshot before, before, I, uh, before I put this online. OK. So that's all just using cosine. I haven't even used the policy controller yet, but I'm trying to show you shift left and just validating this stuff with, with uh, Q. And once you have done that, it's incredibly easy to use the six tour policy controller because now you're just actually copying and pasting. So uh, I can take all those definitions, put them all together. You can run trim if you want to, not mandatory, but it'll help um, that, that stuff. Then I can run cosine verify if I wanted to use cosine to double check that it's all working. And then once there, I have all that queue, all I got to do is copy and paste it in. So I, I cropped it just for the purposes of uh, running this example. Um, but I can, um, if you want to see the full example, you can use that repo. Um, but it's nothing you haven't seen yet. It's just the other definitions and then um, adding them in here as uh, things that are being validated. So let me run that. And so what I'll do is I'm going to turn on enforcement in my repo, and then I'll put all these things together. I'll try to deploy this. So, and I'm just going to use the chain guard enforce product to install this, but it's not really part of it. You could have installed the if you just wanted to the policy controller aspect to it, you could have done this uh, separately. And I'm, I imagine I probably got logged out by this point. So I'm going to log in real quick. And if you're not running chain guard enforce, you don't necessarily have to care about this part, but I'm just going to use this as a uh, example to show what this would look like. And I installed the policy using the chain CTL policies aspect to it. It's got a policy called code review. And again, all that was is just the policies we created already, copied and pasted into uh, my six store, pol my cluster image policy CRD. And it's going to validate the predicate. It's going to validate the repo, the author email, the independent review, all that stuff. You don't even have to use these definition fields, but they're helpful if you want to. Um, they're helpful for a lot of reasons. One, uh, you could create these as packages that get imported into different policies. So you're not doing a bunch of boilerplate things. 
Um, and then you could, you know, if you had multiple authors, for instance, in this attestation, you just have to cross-reference them once. So I like to use them as a default, um, but if you're doing something simple, they're really not necessarily necessary at all. And if you want to just validate with raw JSON, they're not necessary at all either. Um, but I copied and pasted that in there, and then I'm going to, um, oh, that's my readme, and it'll come back here, and then I will try to run this. And I'm guessing this will pass because um, it does have that attachment. So we hope it passes. And great, that passes. But just to keep us honest, let's um, let's go change the policy. Uh, and you know we'll mess it up on purpose just to make sure that it's working. So let's see. I'll delete that pod. Let's see. Let's see. I'll just leave it. It manually. Somewhere in my history, I've got it pretty cool zero. There we go. You can see I've you can see I've run this a lot of times, so I can't remember commands. So there we go. Kubectl is lead the pod. Grace pretty equals zero. All right. Now, just to keep us honest, I will mess up the policy on purpose, we'll say that the example has to come from uh, example.org as example. And then we will I'll delete that policy and add it back. You can update it, but just to be doubly sure that it's gone, make sure that there's no policies at all. And then we will install the policy again. And yeah, now it's giving us a warning because we didn't, all we said for our identity was that uh, it had to be signed by Keystore because we didn't necessarily care about who's signing it for the purposes of this demo. Um, but if you wanted to, you could add, you know, that it had to be signed by, uh, you know, had to come from your GitHub SSO and it had to be signed from a chingar.dev email address or whatever your, you know, corporate SSO is. Uh, that's all information that you can set in there. Um, but now this is created, and, and again, this should break this time because uh, we changed, let's see, where do we change? We changed this. It's the author email has to be example.org now, right? And that should fail because the this is what we attached to it as part of our attestation was that the email address of the author is ends in example.com. So this should actually fail. So if I go to run that same image again that passed, uh, let's hope this fails. The demo gods are with us. And yes, that failed. And it tells you that the author had an invalid email um, because the value was example.com. And that was out of the bounds um, we uh, expected, or we had um, this as the policy example.org. So that is um, building it by example. And that's towards the end of my presentation. Um, I put all the code examples that I used for this on six store custom policies, uh, GitHub repo. Um, if you have specific examples about um, syntax, check the Q spec. Um, and also, you know, feel free to just tag me in the Slack channel. There's some, if you're doing some basic stuff, you just go to the six store.dev um, site or check the six store policy controller readme. Um, but if you're trying to create something custom and you know, you're, you're hitting some troubles, you know, feel free to just tag me in the Slack channel and I can, um, point you on your way. So thanks everyone for uh, joining. Let me see back to my original. Uh, appreciate your time. Um, hope this was helpful. I know it was probably a little bit more advanced than we nor normally cover things on a um, on a on a webinar, but um, yeah, I think there's been enough six store talks out there that hopefully you can grab one of those if you just want you know really the high level uses. Um, and hopefully if you're creating policies that you found this helpful. But if there's anything else you want to see, you know, just uh, feel free to reach out. So thanks, everyone. Talk to you later.